Okay, so um, I'm glad to be here to talk about this, this this topic I'm currently interested in. And I tried very hard to make my talk as simple as possible. So if I did a terrible job, I apologize in advance. So today I'm going to talk about the growth rate of eigenfunction. And uh, I try to review a few basic notations. First, the eigenfunctions I'm talking about is the classical eigenfunctions for the Laplacian <coughs> operator. So there is nothing fancy here. And on a smooth, compact manifold without boundary, we have this uh, settings, this is Laplacian. I'm using the part of Laplacian for simplicity. And uh, also I'm using the, uh, actually I'm talking about eigenvalues corresponding to the square root of Laplacian, which is a pseudo different operator. And we have those smooth L2 normalized eigenfunctions because these eigenfunctions are basically speaking in L2 space. And uh, it's a basic fact that we have a discrete set of eigenvalues uh, in the, like this. So the basic questions in this field are the first, how the eigenvalues are distributed on the real axis. And the second one is how large the eigenfunctions are. And of course, to answer the second question, you have to properly ask, how should we measure the largeness of the eigenfunctions? And uh, so, also, the first question which you are about to see is actually a special type of, a, that of the second question. Let's temporarily focus on the first one the first. Uh, so for the first question, we have the classical Weil formula or the Weil law. That is, if you consider the eigenvalue counting function, which is the number of the eigenvalues do not exceed uh, lambs, then we have this very simple and beautiful expansion formula. You have a remainder term in the power of minus one. And uh, so the key idea to prove this formula in a modern language is to use the following operator, the so-called half wave operator, and you consider its trees and you take inverse Fourier transform. So therefore you can bring the harmonic analysis or uh, oscillator integral <coughs> analysis into spectral analysis. This is the key formula for all. And now this half wave operator is the, in fact, the Fourier transform of the spectral measure. Uh, this is a spectral measure with value as the uh, spectral projection. And uh, so this, uh, for uh, the Schwarz kernel of this operator, we have the following formula. And as you can see, this part is actually the uh, trace of the formula, which is the Fourier transform of the direct measure supported on the eigenvalues. So it's not surprising that we have such formula here. And uh, also this operator, why it is called half wave is because it is also the fundamental solution to this, uh, to this half wave Cauchy problem. Uh, sometimes uh, some mathematicians prefer to use the cosine transform instead of the Fourier transform, which is uh, roughly speaking the real part of this operator Then you have the fundamental solution to the wave equation. Therefore, there is a strong connection between the wave equation and the eigenfunction estimate. So there are two things I want to mention about the, the classical value law. The first, it is sharp on sphere, which means on sphere, if you uh, count the eigen, num number of eigenvalues, you will have a remainder term exactly comparable to this one. And also, the second is, it is rarely sharp on other manifolds. Now, for example, on towers, on the flat towers, because we have an explicit construction of the eigenfunctions on towers. There are just uh, trigonometric polynomials satisfying this special property. So the eigenvalues on towers are just the lattice points on a large circle with the radius uh, lambs. Then it's a classical result that in 1950, local proof you have a very large improvement over the classical value law. So this leaves us an interesting question to ask. On which manifold, how large can we improve the value formula? Uh, so a key progress was made by Duchenmann and Guillemin in 1975 in which they proved the so-called uh, duchenmann guillemin wave trace formula or wave trace argument. Uh, basically speaking, what they did were uh, First, the trace of this operator is actually smooth. When t is not equal to the period of any periodic geodesic, if any, or zero. And the second, which is a natural corollary to the first one, is that if the, ge the periodic geodesics 
are of zero Lewis measure on this spherical bundle on the manifold. That is to say, we not, uh, we not only consider the geodesic itself, but also the directions of these geodesics. Then we have an improvement. So we improve from a small, from big O to the small here. So this gives us some, uh, some uh, inspiration that if you try to improve the well formula, you'd better start with a manifold with as few periodic geodesics as possible. So a good candidate will be a manifold without conjugate points. <coughs> uh, recall that the conjugate points are uh, such special points on the manifold there, where there is a high concentration of, you know, of uh, geodesics. So in 1977, Broad put a manifold without conjugate points. For example, a manifold with non-positive curvature or even better with negative <coughs> curvature. And we have this log lamps improvement. So this verifies the uh, Gushmat preliminary result. Now we have done two things uh, to Im the uh, improvement over on towers and the improvement on manifolds with non positive curvature. They serve as the two basic models in spectral analysis. If you set up anything and you start by improving it uh, on towers and on manifold with non positive curvature respectively, because they are just uh, say flat towers and uh, say hyperbolic manifold and on sphere as, as well, but everything is pretty much sharp on sphere because sphere has the most periodic geodesics because every geodesic on sphere is actually periodic. So you cannot improve anything virtually in, in terms of spectral analysis on spheres. And uh, as I said, the, uh, the eigenvalue problem is just a special type of eigenfunction problem because uh, the well formula is essentially speaking just an infinity estimate of eigenfunctions in terms of this. And uh, so we are interested in uh, such type of uh, estimates for eigenfunctions when lamp is large. Here, of course, lamp are just the eigenvalues. So if we have an L infinity type estimate, then it's natural to ask what if you replace infinity by a finite number P, like say, of course, this is trivial if we use L2 here because L2 is equal to L2. And we can interpret between L2 and L infinity to get a trivial uh, estimate for eigenfunctions. But we are interested in something more. We are interested in the LP estimate to break up the uh, convexity here. So it turned out uh, until very late in 1987, Chris uh, proved that the following LP estimates to break up the convexity. He used a very special exponent here. You don't have to uh, remember this complex uh, exponents here. You just know that there are two pieces in the estimates. One piece is small and one piece is large. And again, these things are sharp on spheres, but with more uh, delicate uh, structures, which I'm gonna talk about later. So now our goal is to improve SOX results on different manifolds, say on manifolds with non-positive curvature and on towers. And uh, this special exponent appears because the, uh, the oscillator integral technique used, or more specifically speaking, the uh, Carlson Schwinn type uh, oscillator integrals. So on manifold with non-positive curvature, we have, of course, we can, uh, we can interpret this estimate with broad results. We call broad result is just an L infinity type estimate. So we can have this trivial uh, estimates when P is large. But as I said, we are only interested in non-trivial results. So in this year, uh, Hesu <coughs> and Casey proved that you can actually have a very small improvement over <coughs> this one. And uh, not surprisingly, they use a property that the uh, log lamp is comparably smaller than any positive number of lamp. So by using, by manipulating the, uh, the half-wave operator, they can actually prove this with the price of losing the endpoint case. So this is very typical in harmonic analysis. You lose endpoint, and then you have something slightly better. And in general, this thing is going to be uh, something like a log. Well, this is roughly speaking because uh, the geodesic on such manifolds with non negative curvature, they are uh, leaving each other at the rate comparably to an exponential function. 
And uh, there are some mathematicians who believe that uh, you can actually have a power improvement over this one, just like on Taurus. Well, so far, we have no idea how to break the log barrier on a generic manifold with negative curvature. But that is, roughly speaking, everything is based on more or less uh, the uh, Brabs argument here. So our technique is always to interpret with L infinity n, and we try to improve some estimates when p is small, but you have to rely on Brabs argument. So it is it seems very hard or even impossible to break a log barrier, but there are still some mathematicians who believe that at least on surface with negative curvature, you can have a power improvement. Now let's go back to Taurus. Uh, things are much more interesting and perhaps much more difficult on Taurus because on Taurus we have explicit information of the eigenfunctions. So far the best result, uh, surprisingly, is a quite old result due to Zygmunt with the so-called L4 estimate. That is on Taurus T2, especially on T2, we have a uniformly bounded uh, P estimate. Uh, he used a very special property of the circle S1, which is not shared by S2 or any higher dimensional spheres. So you cannot apply his technique to higher dimensional towers. So this is a very interesting for us, what happens on higher dimensional towers. Uh, on, on T3, we have, uh, due to a relatively simple arithmetic observation, we have an epsilon power bound for L4 norm. And here, epsilon is an arbitrary small positive number. And uh, a big progress was made in the year before last year in which Bourguin proved that on the higher dimensional towers, we also have a similarly epsilon power bound for LP norm when P is small. Of course, P, P equals four is a special case uh, here. And this is uh, based on an earlier work of Bourguin and Gouff in the same year in which they developed a very powerful multilinear also it's an integral technique to improve the Thomas Stein restriction conjecture. So if uh, this is uh, the typical situation in harmonic analysis, anytime you see something arbitrarily small, you assume it is zero. So it is very natural to conjecture that on higher dimensional towers, we have a similar uniform bound for some LP norm bigger than two, perhaps smaller than something. And, uh, so far, we have no idea how to prove this, how to break the uh, epsilon power barrier. It seems even much harder compared with the negative curvature case. So this is. Uh, yes. Uh, there is actually no log lambda coming from Taurus because on Taurus, uh, oh, hold on for a second. Yes. So uh, now everything pretty much stuck on manifold, uh, on, on manifold with a positive curvature on towers. So probably we should fr refresh our mind by looking at the new research direction. So let's recall uh, the, the uh, general philosophy in this field. So if the, uh, the growth rate or LP estimate of eigenfunctions somehow reflect the largeness of its half wave operator, and we know that the singularity of this operator propagates along the geodesic. And especially they have a high concentration on the periodic geodesic. So it is interesting or prob probably natural to think that the global LP estimate can be in some sense dominated or controlled by the restriction of eigenfunctions over such geodesic lines. So let's look at a motivating example again on 2D sphere. So on, on such manifold, on such surface, we have the so-called spherical harmonics. Uh, if we parameterize the sphere by theta and the phi, which will be the latitude and the longitude respectively, then we have such expression for the, uh, for the eigenfunctions of Laplacian that is a product of an exponential function and an associated Lagrange polynomial. So you don't have to uh, focus on the details of this construction, but you, you need to know that there are two extremal cases. The first one is so-called the zonal spherical harmonic in which m equals zero, and you have a classical Lagrange polynomial in the variable of cosine state. And uh, you also have the sectorial or sometimes called the uh, highest weight spherical harmonics uh, in which the norm of such a 
harmonics is a normalized uh, power of sine six. So if we uh, observe the graph here, I copied this graph from uh, Mathematica, so thanks to Wolfram. And uh, so if these, surf these surfaces are the value of a norm of the harmonics, as you can tell, this line are the zonal harmonics, and these are the uh, sectorial harmonics. So these harmonics have a high concentration of value near the poles, near the North Pole and the South Pole. And these harmonics have high concentration near the equator. So for such manifold, it is uh, natural to consider the restriction of the eigenfunction on these points. And of course, you cannot talk about integral over points. So it is natural to consider the L infinity norm of <coughs> such eigenfunctions. And similarly, for such eigenfunctions, you consider the restriction over the geodesics, which is equator on sphere. And that is why uh, the, the classical result of SOS is sharp on the uh, zonal harmonics when p is large, and it is sharp for the sectoral harmonics when p is small. So the uh, general uh, result, similarly to the SOX result in this research direction was in was relatively recent between Burke, Drug, and Tevkikov in 2006, inspired by an early work by uh, Resnikov in 2004. They proved that if gamma is a interlaced geodesic arc on a surface, and we have similarly two pieces of LP estimate, one P is small one p is large. Similarly, this is sharp on sectorial harmonics, and this is sharp on zonal surface harmonics. Well, there have been many, uh, so there have been many uh, research in investigating the relation between the restricted LP estimates and the global LP estimates. So I'm going to talk about only one, which is the most uh, typical one, I believe. Uh, in the year of 2009, due to SOX, based on the early work of Bogin, they proved that on a surface, uh, again, if you have the unique length the geodesic arc and uh, all the eigenfunctions are L2 normalized, then these two statements are actually equivalent. So, in fact, if you observe this, uh, this type of LP norm or this type of function, this is actually a, uh, a Kakaya type maximal function because you're actually measuring the size of the eigenfunction in various of tubes. So later in 2011, Sogren and to prove that the late this one is actually true on surface with non-positive curvature, and of course, the first one is also true. So this, uh, let's return to Taurus to see if there's anything interesting. Uh, it is a classical result. Uh, I'm not sure who proved it at first, but it got to be some big mathematician in the 19th century that uh, the L infinity norm of eigenfunctions on T2 is bounded by epsilon power. And uh, you can see hardly write classical textbook on number theory for this result. So we naturally have L2 restricted bound for eigenfunctions on such torus. So this leaves us a question whether it is possible to prove uh, similarly, a uniform bound, uniformly restricted bound on T2 uh, for a curvature, for, for a curve, uh, for general smooth curve, or perhaps for a curve with curvature. And uh, in the year of uh, 2011, Borgen and Rusnik, uh, by the way, Borgen proved many things in that year. So if gamma, <laughs> so if gamma is an analytic and the curved arc in T2, also in T3, <coughs> we have a very surprising equivalent L2 norm, this restricted L2 norm and global L2 norm on T2 or T3, when, lam when lambda is large. So again, they conjecture that this is also true for a higher dimensional torus, and uh, especially for a real analytic curve. And also there are many more general conjectures to see if it is uh, also true for a, a real smooth curve, or even a real smooth, so for the, so this uh, actually contains two parts, so a lower bound and a higher bound for the restricted L2 estimate. So if we do not have the, uh, curve, the curvature requirement, then we do not have the lower bound. 
but we still uh, but we can still ask if we we are going to have the upper bound, even we do not assume the curvature assumption. So we have many conjectures to work on, and uh, that's all. Thank you.